Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing this relatively recent paper that potentially discovers yet another so-called exomoon. An object that can be defined as a natural satellite of some sort of a distant exoplanet. At least in terms of the orbital parameters. And although generally there have been previous suggestions and previous candidates of so-called exomoons in the past, what makes this one particularly interesting is of course its size and its mass. If confirmed, it would be at least 2.6 times larger than planet Earth, technically making this a super-Earth, or I guess a super-Earth exomoon, whatever you want to call it. Either way, it would be actually a very interesting and very exotic object. And it would also be the second time such a dramatically large object, large exomoon, has been officially identified somewhere out there in our galaxy. But in this video, I also wanted to touch on some of the previous potential discoveries, and also why it's actually kind of exciting to find these objects, even though so many exoplanets have also been discovered, with many of them potentially hosting their own exomoons, simply based on what we actually see in the solar system and the number of moons that planets like Jupiter and Saturn have. And so let's just start with the idea of how we search for these objects and why they're so difficult to find. Naturally, unlike exoplanets, exomoons would be smaller, generally speaking, and would also be extremely difficult to detect using modern techniques. For example, the most common method of finding exoplanets, the transit method, that's essentially represented right here, that's when you look at the shadow of the planet passing in front of the star, would generally produce such a minuscule observation that it would be quite difficult to determine if it's just noise or an actual object passing in front of the star. And because of this, pretty much all of the detections of previous potential candidates of exomoons, even today, are still just candidates. Mostly because the statistical techniques and analysis used to determine if something is an object or just noise, even today are still having trouble distinguishing one from another. So, for example, back in 2017, Kepler-1625b that you see right here was potentially identified to have some sort of a Neptune-sized moon around it although it most likely resembles something like this if it does exist. And it's relatively large and actually relatively massive, even compared to the planet that it's orbiting. But, once again, this is just a candidate, and even after four years, quite a lot of teams still disagree that this is anything. A lot of teams still argue that this is just noise and does not really represent any actual object, simply because this is just not enough proof. And one of the reasons why it's not enough proof is really because of the data that we're dealing with. Here, the actual observation of a star looks kind of like this. It's just a few pixels on a screen. And so even identifying a planet passing in front of a star here would be really challenging. Now imagine doing this with the moon. But it's really because of these challenges that this right here was created a few years ago. The Hunt for Exomoons with Kepler is essentially a project whose main purpose is to try to discover these almost impossible to see objects, basically pushing the envelope and trying to find new techniques in order to identify something that's almost impossible to see otherwise. And some of the main targets for this research so far have actually been giant planets farther away from their parent stars. Mostly because, as we know from the solar system, both Jupiter and Saturn do have relatively large satellites. And at the same time, we also know that a typical satellite has a much higher chance of surviving around the planet if it's much farther from the parent star, simply because there are less tidal interactions, and so the star is unlikely to steal one of these objects for itself. And so for this particular study, the scientists focused on some of the older data from the Kepler telescope and focused on 70 different planets, and here we're talking about cold gas giants extremely similar to Jupiter and Saturn, and tried to see if they had any unusual signals around them that could potentially indicate maybe another large exomoon. And, well, the preliminary data here suggests that there is something going on. But because this is about 5,500 light years away from us, so basically really, really far, and because once again we're just dealing with a few pixels captured by the Kepler telescope, it would probably take years, if not decades, to confirm this using some of the new observations from maybe Hubble Telescope or possibly even James Webb Telescope. Which is also why quite a lot of different astronomers have already expressed their doubt about this particular discovery. But honestly, it's anyone's guess at this point. The data is suggesting there is something, but at the same time, without further proof, we're not going to be able to determine this for sure. Either way, the idea of pushing the envelope and trying to discover these objects that are extremely difficult to find is still quite admirable. More importantly, if these objects are real, it sort of suggests to us that some exomoons or some satellites are practically almost the same size as the actual planet they're orbiting. 
maybe not as massive, but in terms of the size, it's quite incredible. In this case, this is actually the older discovery from back in 2017, but this is sort of what it would look like if we were to put the planet and the satellite together. And so if we're being technical here, this is more of a binary planetary system. But what's more exciting about this type of research and discoveries of these exomoons is the potential of finding these exomoons around, for example, a red dwarf and maybe even in the habitable zone of the red dwarf. And so let's just jump into the famous TRAPPIST-1 system to illustrate why this is important. So a lot of red dwarf systems will usually have planets, with some maybe even terrestrial planets, that are sometimes in a habitable zone where we do expect liquid water might exist. But the thing about these planets is that, well, they generally are tightly locked to the actual star, meaning that the single day here is equivalent to a single year. And because here a planet will usually orbit the star in a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks or so, it does actually create a lot of problems for the potential habitability of this planet, simply because it just stays too hot and too cold for too long. However, if these planets have a moon around them, and especially if this moon is relatively large, the moon in this case will probably be also tightly locked, but in this case to the planet itself. And as it orbits around the planet, it actually has a chance to maybe even have climatic conditions that would be ideal for liquid water, for permanent atmosphere, and maybe even life. And so today a lot of scientists really hope to find one of these exomoons, a large exomoon, around some kind of a red dwarf star somewhere out there. With some calculations suggesting that any moon size and mass of Ganymede, the moon of Jupiter, would very likely have just the perfect conditions to maintain permanent atmosphere and maybe even liquid water. And so even though the planets might not be habitable, the moons, if they're large enough around these planets, could potentially host life. But once again, because of the difficulty of finding these objects, at the moment nobody really knows what's going on and if these objects actually exist around red dwarfs. But if this recently discovered exomoon is real, it suggests that moons can actually get really big and potentially be just as big as planet Earth, if not bigger. Which also means that at least one of them somewhere out there could be very similar to planet Earth, even in its atmospheric conditions. Although for this particular discovery, chances are that it was actually created in a very similar way to a typical planet and not a typical satellite. In other words, it was probably created from all the gas that was piling up and increasing in size, similar to the accretion process that usually creates planets. And there's also quite a high chance that it used to be a separate object, so in other words, it was a planet, and might have been just captured by its partner, turning this into a binary system. Naturally, all of this right now is just a speculation, because nobody really knows what's happening here just yet. But the other exciting part about the discovery is the fact that the planet that was found a few years ago is approximately 1.6 astronomical units away from the parent star that's also somewhat similar to our own Sun. And as we know, that's basically the distance of Mars to the Sun. In other words, if this moon exists, and of course, if judging by its size it's some sort of a super Earth, it might potentially have interesting terrestrial conditions resembling current Mars. But because it would have more mass than Mars, it might actually have atmosphere. Once again, huge speculation, but still exciting. And speaking of potentially exciting exomoons that we could find one day, one of the most interesting star systems where the scientists are really hoping to find an exomoon is a system known as Gliese 876. There are several really giant planets here in habitable zone of the star system, and if at least one of them has these really large satellites or moons orbiting around them, there's a really high chance they would be habitable with maybe even Earth-like conditions on the surface. But at the moment, the techniques are just not powerful enough to find them just yet. And speaking of techniques, one of the most interesting ways of finding these objects is what you're about to see right here. This is known as the TTV method, or transit timing variation. Essentially, when we're looking at an orbiting planet, and if we start seeing that something doesn't add up, and it seems to have transits at slightly different times, this potentially means two things. Either there's another planet somewhere in the orbit that's changing its passages, or maybe this planet is being pulled on by its satellite, by its moon. And this particular method would be one of the ways that we can either confirm or even find some of these satellites, some of the moons or exomoons around some of these exoplanets. But it would also have to be confirmed using some other method that we just don't have yet. 
But there are some other methods as well. For example, some of the first planets were actually discovered around pulsars, and because of the pulsations coming from these objects, it becomes possible to find exomoons around those planets as well, simply because we could maybe see these slight variations in the pulsations of the neutron stars. So far, no exomoon has ever been found this way, but it is possible in theory. On the other hand, it also is possible to find an exomoon, alone of course with the exoplanet, using so-called gravitational lensing method. This is basically when an object passes in front of a star, bending the light just a little bit, producing a tiny tiny variation in what we're seeing from the star. And at least one object has been potentially discovered this way, but the primary object in this case was a brown dwarf. And so in this case it's a satellite of a brown dwarf, not necessarily an exomoon. It's also possible to use what's known as the Doppler spectroscopy by looking at the changes in the redshift and the blue shift to try to discover the slight variations in the velocity and thus discover a moon potentially orbiting around the planet. But this method is also extremely difficult and requires a lot of precision, so nothing has been found this way either. But there is actually a really intriguing method that has been used to discover something using the magnetosphere and radio waves coming from a distant planet. We know that Io orbiting Jupiter causes the magnetic field of Jupiter to transform in a very specific way that can be then detected from planet Earth. Something extremely similar has been discovered coming from a distant object, from a brown dwarf again, suggesting of course that it potentially has a satellite in its orbit. And because the signals were extremely similar to the ones from Jupiter, this was to date possibly the most likely discovery of an exomoon. And today this method has a name. It's known as the IO controlled decometric emissions. Essentially the emissions we usually observe from IO that are produced in the magnetosphere of Jupiter. But this also requires a very powerful magnetosphere and it requires a similar mechanism to what we see around Jupiter. And so it only applies to certain really massive gas giants. And then we have another method that potentially will never really be used again. This was in regards to this really unusual object with the largest rings we've ever seen. The object we'll be discussing in one of the future videos once again, the planet known as G1407b. And when the rings of this planet were discovered a few years ago, they were also found to have really large gaps between them. Today it's believed that these gaps are probably where there is some sort of a moon in orbit of this particular planet. And specifically, in this case, it could be a really massive moon. It was even suggested that some of these moons could be as massive as planet Venus. But naturally, because only one such planet has ever been found, this is just a really really rare exception. And also, it still needs a lot of confirmation as well. Anyway. We'll be talking a little bit more about this planet and some of the recent discoveries in one of the future videos on the channel, so make sure to subscribe not to miss it, but for now that's pretty much it. An exciting discovery of a really massive exomoon around a distant exoplanet, but for now nobody really knows if it's really there and confirming this would be really difficult. And so until future discoveries, thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel or Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.